Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's talk about determinants. Okay, of course, the catch here is we are not talking about determinants uh, for matrices over a field, but rather over general rings. Okay, so recall. Uh, um, so let me make the following assumption that R, let R be a commutative ring now, let R be a commutative ring. Recall that means in our notation, if I look at what we call R op, the identity map, it sends every element to itself. This is an isomorphism of R to R op, right? Because the, um, operation in R op is just the product in the reverse order, but since R is commutative, AB is the same as BA. Okay? Another way of saying it is therefore that the identity map from R to R op is an isomorphism. Okay? So, of course, why, why do I want to bring in R op and so on? So, recall from last time we talked about how to uh, think about endomorphisms of free modules. So, a homomorphism from Rn to Rn is really given by an n cross n matrix and this matrix we said should correctly be thought of as an element of R op, but uh, since R is commutative, I can replace R op by R right? because of this fact that I just said. Um, this is true for R commutative. Okay, and recall how the map was defined given a homomorphism phi to that homomorphism we could pick the standard basis of Rn what we call the Eis and uh, you just apply phi to Ei and write out the, the entries I mean write the answer as a linear combination of the Eis again and write the entries in the ith column. Right? So, this we call the matrix of the uh, homomorphism phi. Okay, so now uh, what we want to do is to talk about automorphisms. Okay, so what's an automorphism? Remember that just means it's an invertible endomorphism. So an automorphism of Rn just means it's a map phi which also admits an inverse. Okay, so uh, phi is said to be an automorphism if there exists a map psi. Uh, which is again an endomorphism of Rn such that phi composition psi is the same as psi composition phi and this is equal to the identity map of Rn. Okay, so, this is the usual notion of uh, automorphisms. It is an isomorphism from the module Rn to itself. Okay, now, uh, here is the um, important thing that if I have, uh, you know, so the question now really becomes every endomorphism is associated to a matrix, but what can I say about automorphisms? What do matrices of automorphisms look like? Okay. And so, here is the, here is the main proposition which answers that question and we will say a little bit more about this. So, the proposition says that phi is an automorphism. The same notation as before. It's so map from Rn to Rn. If and only if the matrix of phi has the following property. Look at the matrix of phi, n cross n matrix. If and only if the determinant of that matrix. Well, what is the determinant? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. If and only if the determinant is a unit of the ring R. Okay, so, recall the unit means it is an invertible element of the ring R. Okay? So, uh, let me before actually getting into the proof and explaining more about this, let us just do an example. Suppose I take the ring R to be Z. 
Okay, and suppose I take a matrix A, which is say 2, 0, 0, 1, very simple diagonal matrix. Well, the determinant means the usual thing. You sort of know how to take determinants of matrices um, by using the formula. You expand along rows or columns and so on. So, in this case, if I have 2, 0, 0, 1, the determinant is just 2 times 1, which is 2. But observe, if I think of this as uh, being a matrix with values over the underlying ring Z, then 2 is not a unit. It is not invertible in Z. Okay, it is of course invertible if you think of it as an element of Q, the rational numbers or R, the real numbers or complex numbers and so on. But uh, it is not a unit in, in Z. Okay. So, the point is, uh, you know, so let us just try and uh, so, this is what I mean by saying that the determinant must be a unit of R. So, let us first, uh, so le, you know, as a preparatory step to proving this proposition, let us first convert this statement about automorphisms into the corresponding statement about its uh, matrix. So, observe uh, phi is an automorphism means there exists an inverse psi, this is an automorphism, it is the same as saying there exists psi from Rn to Rn such that as we said phi composition psi is psi composition phi is the identity operator on Rn. But now we also looked at uh, what does this mean in terms of the matrices. So, I said that the map which associates to each homomorphism its matrix that map is a, a, a ring isomorphism right. In other words composition of maps goes to product of matrices. Uh, I mean, if you were over a non-commutative ring, you would have to take R op, but over a commutative ring, it is just the same as R itself. So, phi composition psi. So, let me take the matrices on both sides. This is the product of the two matrices of phi and psi. On the other side, it is the product of the matrices psi and phi. And the matrix of the identity operator is just the usual n cross n identity matrix okay, with ones on the diagonal. So, remember one is now here an element of the ring R. Okay, so, I think of the, the multiplicative unit of the ring R. Okay, so, this is this is the n cross n identity. So, now what does this mean? Uh, and, and conversely, if suppose I could find corresponding to the matrix uh, of phi, if I could find another matrix such that you know the product gave me identity in both directions, then I could just take psi to be the the homomorphism the the endomorphism whose matrix is that given matrix okay in other words it's it's sort of easy to see because everything is a, you know you can identify homomorphisms with uh, i'm sorry uh, you can identify endomorphisms with matrices n cross n matrices so i can sort of reverse this this chain of um, equations okay uh, if not if there exists a matrix of psi such that Okay, so, what does this uh, really mean? It says that to understand when phi is an automorphism, it is enough to understand when the matrix of phi has an inverse. Okay, so, this, this matrix here is the inverse of this matrix phi. Okay, so, therefore, phi is an automorphism is the same as saying the matrix of phi uh, is an invertible matrix. Okay, it's got a matrix inverse, but now wh where is this happening? This is in the space of all n cross n matrices with entries in the ring R. Okay, so recall that this itself is a ring, the ring of matrices with entries in in any ring R itself is a ring, and we are saying that this matrix phi has to be an invertible matrix in that ring, it should be an invertible element of that ring. Okay. So, uh, what we need to therefore do is really the following uh, proposition. So, what we need to prove is really the following fact that when is a matrix invertible? So, a matrix A in the ring of n cross n matrices is invertible if and only if its determinant is a unit.
Okay. So, this is really what uh, our proposition amounts to. I have just converted everything from homomorphisms to matrices. Okay, so, first thing is what is the definition of the determinant? Well, it is the most obvious definition. So, let us just convince ourselves that even if, if uh, A uh, is a matrix with entries in some commutative ring R, I can still make sense of the determinant of A. So, how do we define the determinant? Well, we have the usual definition where we expand along the rows and so on, but uh, in one shot if one sort of wanted to write it, here is how we, we usually write this. We say take all permutations of S n, permutations in S n, permutations of 1 through n and uh, do the following. Let us look at the, I okay, will call this epsilon of sigma, this is a sign. So, maybe we will just write this as a sign. So, remember we have the sign of a permutation, just plus 1 if it is an even permutation and minus 1 if it is an odd permutation. So, I take the sign of, of sigma and then a uh, 1 sigma of 1. So, first row sigma 1th column, take the element in the second row sigma 2th column and so on. So, I take this product a n sigma n okay, and this is some overall sigma n s n. Okay, this is the usual definition of the determinant in terms of the expansion along rows and so on. Uh, so, what, what this amounts to is like saying if I have say 3 cross 3 matrix. So, I, I take this uh, from the first row, maybe this from the second, this from the third or you know I could take this from the first row, I could take this from the second row, this from the third row and so on. So, I, I sort of run through all the possibilities of choosing one entry from each row and one and each column. So, I have to choose n exact entries, I take their product and then I multiply by the sign, there is always a sign involved in the determinant expression and this sum is exactly the determinant. So, observe that this makes perfect sense over any commutative ring R. Okay? So, this firstly the answer lies in R because it is a product of elements from R and the commutativity of, of the ring is required so that I do not have to you know keep track of the order in which um, you know, I mean you could conceivably define this for non-commutative rings, but it would not have the nice properties that you, you expect of it. Okay? So, a commutative ring at least the nice thing is that you do not need to keep track of the, the order in which you, you multiply. Right? You take something from the first, first uh, row and then you take something from the second row or, or you do it in the other order. Okay? So, this will ensure that the nice properties of the determinants remain. For example, if you interchange two rows, the, the value of the determinant becomes a negative. Okay? So, things like that we want to happen. That will only happen if you assume that the ring R is commutative. Okay, so, we only define it in that case. Okay, great. So, observe that the order is immaterial and the definition makes sense. It gives me an element of R and uh, the other main reason for doing this, of course, it has all the usual properties that we expect of a determinant. Okay, so, for example, so, I have already said it belongs to R. So, I will just reiterate that the determinant of A is an element of the underlying ring R. Uh, second property, if you interchange two rows or columns, if two rows or two columns are interchanged, the value becomes negative. Minus of the original determinant. Okay, uh, that is the second property. Property 3, if I um, you know I, I can do this recursive expansion along rows or columns, can recursively expand. So, this is just the usual way in which you, we compute it. that is just the another way of saying that it is the same definition. And the fourth property which is arguably the most important which says that if I take the product of two matrices, the determinant of the product is just the product of the determinants. Okay, this, is, this is not so easy to prove from the definition. Okay, it requires a little work maybe using the uh, elementary row operations and so on and this is something we will we'll come to later. So, for now just think of this as uh, a black box. So, just accept this formula 
it works um, in some sense for the same reason that it works over a field it is just a formal property of, of multiplying two things out and so on. Okay. So, uh, we, we will give a proof of this uh, during the uh, you know maybe one of the problem sessions. Okay. So, let us go back to what we want to prove. So, we really want to say that the determinant is a good way of detecting when a matrix is invertible. Okay. If the determinant turns out to be a unit in the underlying ring then the matrix is invertible and uh, conversely. So, let us prove this prove this uh, statement. So, first observe that if A is invertible, so that is the easier half of the implication. So, if A is invertible, in the matrix ring, what does that mean? There exists a matrix B, such that A B equals B A equals identity. And now, we use the, the property of determinants that determinant of A B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. So, this is det A det B and the determinant of the identity is just 1, it is just the product of the diagonal values. And so, this implies that, so now recall everything is in the ring R, all this action is taking place in the inside the ring R, this is a ring element, this is a ring element, right. So, what that means is that the ring element det A has an inverse in the ring, there exists an element in the ring such that their product is 1, okay. So, this is exactly saying that determinant of A is a unit in the ring R, okay. So, that that is this uh, one half of the proposition, okay. Now, let us uh, prove the converse that if the determinant is invertible in the ring, then the matrix A has an inverse matrix. Okay. So, let us do the converse now. So, if determinant of A is a unit. Okay. So, what does that mean? In other words, I can talk about an element called det A inverse in R. Okay. There exists an element which is a multiplicative inverse of the determinant. Okay, now, given this I need to produce a, um, an inverse for an inverse matrix for A and this is uh, I mean if you sort of just uh, think about it for a minute, the clue for how to do this really comes from the formula for the inverse that one uses in the usual case of fields, which is how does one construct or um, compute the inverse of a matrix A well let us let me call that B. This is what we usually do. We say it is 1 by the determinant times uh, what is called the adjoint of the matrix A, right? The, the transpose of the matrix of cofactors of A. So, this is nothing but, um, so our, our usual formula, so let me put it within brackets or a field, uh, sorry within quotes. So, we would write it like this 1 by det A times the matrix called adjoint of A, which is transpose of the cofactor matrix. Right. This is the usual formula. Now, what we have to, I mean this is over a field in general, but what we have to realize is that this formula actually makes perfect sense over any ring, okay, provided I can make sense of 1 by det A. Okay. So, that is exactly what I have assumed that det A inverse is an element of R. Okay. So, let us try just, you know, as a guess, just try making the same definition. So, we will say B let us define B like this and hope that it has the right properties. Okay, so, now let me say uh, B should be an element of where should B lie? It should be an element, it should be an n cross n matrix with entries in R. Well, I will do the following. I will use det A, it is a ring element. The inverse of det A is again, it is assumed to be uh, assumed to exist element of R. So, I will take this element of R and I multiply it by the adjoint matrix. Now, what is adjoint matrix? Does that make, make sense over any ring R? Well, it is the matrix or uh, the transpose of the cofactor matrix, right? The adjoint of a matrix 
is defined like this. This is you take the cofactor matrix of A and then take the transpose. Now, what does that mean? So, question now uh, reduces to uh, does the cofactor matrix make sense, right? Or does it make sense to define cofactors now when you are over an arbitrary ring? Well, what is the cofactor of an element? Uh, suppose I have a matrix A and what is the cofactor of the ijth element? Well, I just look at so i throw j jth column. The cofactor of this element is obtained by deleting the i throw and the jth column. Looking at the remaining matrix that is n minus 1 cross n minus 1, taking its determinant and then multiplying it by a sign, right. So, that is exactly the, the ijth cofactor. So, recall that uh, cofactor of the ijth element of A is nothing but determinant of this matrix in which you delete the i throw jth column and then you multiply it by a sign right that is minus 1 to the i plus j. So, this, this entire definition makes perfect sense even if A has elements from a ring R right because all I am doing finally is computing the determinant of some n minus 1 cross n minus 1 matrix and I can compute determinants of matrices or, or any ring of any size. So, this makes sense. So, this is well defined. Right? This is in fact defined it is an element of R again. Uh, sorry not uh, yeah, yeah the cofactor ij is an element of R. Okay? The cofactor matrix means I for every ij I put the cofactor of ij. Okay, so, this entire definition makes perfect sense and so what do I get finally? The adjoint of A is in fact a well defined matrix defined in the same manner with elements in R. Okay, and now, the question really is if I take the product of A and B then do I get um, do I get the identity matrix right? and similarly the product of B and A. Okay. Now, let us just do one computation, you know, just check one of the rows and all the other rows are similar. Uh, what do I get when I multiply A B, uh, you know, if I look at some say the first row uh, of the answer. So, 1 comma jth element here, what does it look like? Well, it is by definition A 1 K uh, B K J, okay. this is a sum over K. So, what is B? B remember is the transpose of uh, the cofactor matrix multiplied by the determinant. So, what is B k j now? Uh, so, I need to say this is k goes from 1 to n a 1 k. So, what is the B matrix? B is nothing but debt a inverse cofactor transpose. So, the k jth element here is the cofactor of the j kth element. So, this is this into cofactor of the j comma kth element of A okay, because of the transpose and then there is a sign that is minus 1 to the uh, j plus k. Okay, and then there is a, of course, a debt A inverse. So, remember all this is multiplied by a debt A inverse and since anyway everything is a commutative ring I can multiply things in any any order I want. So, I will just put the debt A inverse outside. So, this is determinant of A inverse this is a sum over k. Okay, now, now comes the, the important observation that A 1 k cofactor co of j k. Okay. So, if I put j equals 1, so remember j and k here, so, so sorry j is j is uh, variable, I can I can choose j as I want. If I put j equals 1, so when I take j equals 1 versus j not equal to 1, it is two, 2 cases. If j is 1, this is just going to be the cofactor of the 1 comma kth element of A, right. So, let me just for the moment think of it. If j is 1, then this is the cofactor of the 1 kth element, this is A 1 k. Right? and I am summing over k. So, what does that mean? It is like saying that I take this, this matrix. So, we we'll just draw this matrix here again. So, suppose this is my matrix A. I am running through the first row, the entries of the first row, right? A 1 k as k varies, A 1 1, A 1 2, A 1 3 and so on. I am multiplying each element by its corresponding cofactor because this is exactly the cofactor of that element. 
and the cofactor just means I delete that row and column and look at what's left. But that's exactly how you compute the determinant of a matrix by expanding along the first row. Okay, so when I form when I take j equals one, this sum here turns out to be exactly the uh, the answer is exactly determinant of a because of how the determinant can be computed by expanding along a row and outside remember I have debt a inverse right so debt a inverse into debt a so this answer is just a one okay now uh, what about the other guy suppose j is not one what does that mean it's like saying I take the the entries of the first row okay these these blue dots here and I multiply them with the the cofactors of some other row okay j is different from 1 so for example let's say j is 2 so i i multiply these blue dots with the cofactors of the brown dots okay so I, I i do it along two different rows now the point is that expansion is um, well what what does it mean to um, take the cofactor of, of the brown dots every time I compute the cofactor of a brown dot I will have to delete that second row and the corresponding column right that is how the cofactors of the elements in the second row are computed ok. So, the point is that this answer now for if j is 2 here this answer will not depend on what the those actual values of the brown dots are ok. So, what I am um, concluding so this is the this is the main argument I am multiplying the values of the blue dots here with the cofactors of the brown dots here ok. Now since every time I compute the cofactor of a brown dot I will have to delete the row there so I will have to delete the second row each time and only the remaining elements will will be part of the calculation. So this final answer here does not depend on what the uh, entries of the second row are it is the same answer for all all possible choices of second row ok. Now that is uh, that is a very useful thing to know because here is what I can do then since the answer does not depend on the second row I can choose a convenient I can make a convenient choice of second row. So, let me do the following I will just make the entries of the second row equal to those of the first row. So, let us make this choice I, I now modify my matrix I take the new matrix whose second row entries coincide with the entries of the first row. By the argument we just gave this this sum here does not depend on so it will give me the same answer even after I have done this modification ok. Now let us see whether it makes sense so now what am I doing I am computing the uh, values of the, the blue dots above with the cofactors of, of the corresponding blue dots below. But since I have chosen these numbers to be the same ok each dot above is equal to the value below it now this sum has a meaning I can make sense out of this sum this sum is just the determinant of this new modified matrix when expanded along the second row ok because I have made both blue dot values the same so I can think of it as I, I run over the second row take each blue dot multiply by each cofactor take a blue dot multiply by its cofactor and so on and when I make you know do that summation that is exactly the determinant when I expand along the second row. So, this is therefore going to give me determinant of A inverse that is still outside times determinant of let me call this A hash this modified matrix ok. Now, what was this modified matrix it was obtained by making the entries of the first row and the second row the same ok. But now we know the answer to this because when two rows are identical then the determinant must be 0 right that follows from the fact that when I interchange two rows the value becomes negative. So, in this case therefore, I have obtained that this is 0 ok. So, what does that give us we have finally proved that this product a b when I look at its 1 comma jth element it is 1 if j is 1 and 0 otherwise. So, you, you can repeat the same same sort of argument replacing this one with any other row i you can replace with any row i and then a similar sort of argument works. So, what we have really shown is that uh, only when j equals i you will get one 
and if j is not equal to i you will get 0. So, this argument actually shows that the product a b is identity and you can just repeat the same thing in the other order ok that corresponds to expanding along columns rather than expanding along rows. So, you just have to repeat the same argument. So, in, in some sense what this does is really copies the same proofs that work in the case of fields by realizing that you know you really are not using the property of fields anywhere you it will work perfectly well over any ring any commutative ring provided that that 1 by determinant a that that is the only catch provided that term makes sense then you are ok ok. So, this is a very important uh, uh, sort of statement that a matrix over a ring R is invertible if and only if the determinant of that matrix is a unit in the ring ok. In particular that example that we gave initially this matrix A which is 2 0 0 1 the determinant is not a unit in Z this matrix is not invertible in M 2 of Z ok. So, here is our um, little corollary that if I take this um, so, observe this example that I gave in the beginning which is the matrix 2 0 0 1 is not invertible in the ring of matrices with entries in Z ok. It is I mean it is invertible if you think um, of the ring R as being the rational numbers or Q and so on. And in some sense you can see you know it, it is invertible over Q, it is invertible as an element of M2 of Q and in fact if you if you sort of use the usual way to compute the inverse it is 1 by determinant of A uh, into the transpose of the matrix of cofactors which in this case is this. So, here is the inverse ok the, by the usual formula for computing and you can notice that well these entries are not in Z. So, this is half 0 0 1 that is the inverse right. So, it, it sort of ties up that you can invert it over Q, but the inverse will not have integer entries it is going to have some denominators ok. So, this is this sort of um, theorem is very important and let us uh, end this with a very important proposition which is a corollary of all this analysis with determinants and so on which says that if I have a free module R n ok. So, this is all again everything we have said is only when R is a commutative ring. So, if R is a commutative ring then the free module R n is isomorphic to the free module R m if and only if n equals n ok. So, I mean this is of course, one of the statements we would like to have that the vector spaces have this nice notion of dimension and a vector space uh, say over the complex numbers C n and C m are two different vector spaces if n and m are different right the dimension is n. And uh, we, we would like to prove something similar it turns out we can really only prove it in the case of commutative rings it is not true in general. And for commutative rings the proof sort of proceeds via determinants. So, let us prove let us give a proof of this. Um, so, what does it mean to say R n and R m are isomorphic? It means that there is a isomorphism between them in other words there is a homomorphism phi which admits an inverse. So, in other words there are maps in both directions such that phi psi is the identity. Uh, so, so, phi psi is the identity on R m and psi phi the composition the other order is the identity on R n. And again as we have been doing throughout it is best to convert everything to matrices. So, let us give the matrices names let A denote the matrix of phi, B denote the matrix of psi ok. So, one of them is so let us see what the sizes are this is an m cross n matrix ok A is m cross n and B is n cross m ok. So, we need to prove that m and n are equal. So, we will we'll just make an assumption. So, suppose m is the smaller of the two ok we can repeat the same argument for the other case. Suppose m is smaller than n ok. Now, if m is smaller than n. So, what was a? a was the uh, smaller. So, let us say let us go up there m is the smaller number. So, that means that 
A has fewer rows, more columns. B has uh, more rows and fewer columns. So what does A look like therefore? A looks like this. A is m cross n. So it's got some m rows but lots more columns. It's a rectangle of this kind. B is sort of the opposite. It's got lots more columns and fewer rows. Sorry, lots more rows and fewer columns. Okay, so this is m cross n. This was n cross n. Okay, so now the claim is that I mean, what we are saying really is that when you multiply these two matrices A B, you will get m cross n matrix, m cross m matrix. That's also the identity, and B A is also the identity, right? So that's really what these these two equations mean in terms of homomorphisms the same thing here implies that so we know the following that when I multiply a b it should give me a m cross m matrix so it is the identity m cross n and when I multiply b a it should give me the identity n cross n. Okay? The claim is that this really cannot happen when you multiply two such rectangular matrices both cannot give you the identity. Okay. Specifically, uh, we claim that this can never happen. Okay. The larger one uh, can never be the identity matrix. So let us let us prove that. So claim is this this cannot happen. Okay. So claim uh, B A cannot be the identity. Okay. Remember n is a larger number. So the larger identity matrix that can never happen. Okay. So let us try and prove this. Um, maybe we will just do it sort of by example with uh, of, with sizes. So, let me just take b to be uh, 3 cross 2 for example. So, b has I mean you can make this into a general argument too. So, suppose b looks like this b is say 3 cross 2 okay, and then I multiply it by a which is 2 cross 3, 3 columns and Okay. Now, I, I claim that this product cannot give me the identity. right? So, let us see I want this suppose it gave me the identity where is the contradiction. So, suppose I got this. So, they are all ones. Okay. Suppose I had this where is the contradiction. So, let us do the following. So, uh, let us observe. So, let, let me just move this over. So, let us say this is the answer. Now, uh, let us let us do um, something to this matrix. Let us make B and A somewhat bigger. Okay. So, I am going to make instead of B, I will put one additional row. Okay. So, here is let us do the following. So, let us move these over. So, make some more space for B. So, I am going to augment B now as follows. So, I will put an additional. So, I am going to make both of them into square matrices. So, I have augmented B. Okay. So, this new augmented matrix I will call B hat uh, and A I will augment by just putting zeros on the bottom. Okay, this is a hat. Okay. So, let us let us see I, I claim that the same equation holds if B A is identity. So, if B A is identity then I claim that B hat A hat is also identity where B hat and A hat are just the augmented matrices. Okay. So, I made both n cross n. Why is this? Well, uh, just observe what the the definition of um, you know how how would you have done matrix multiplication? Well, you take the entries in the first row of B and multiply them by the entries in the first column, right? Now that multiplication, what will it do? What is the what is the difference when you went from B to B hat and A to A hat? Well, it has that you know that multiplication involves one extra term which is this 0 into the 0. right? These two blue zeros are extra they were not there initially, but they do not contribute anything to the sum. 
right? It, it's just a zero anyway. So it's only the original two red dots multiplying with the original two red dots that matters. The what I have uh, added extra is just a zero. So the answer here doesn't change. It's still a one. Okay. Similarly, look at the second for example, the next entry. The first row of B is multiplied by the entries of the second column of A hat. And the only additional term I am introducing is this 0 times this 0. Okay? And that is again no contribution. So, it is only the original red into red plus red into red that matters. So, originally the answer was a 0 right? because B into A is identity. Therefore, the, the same answer holds. It is still identity. I mean still a 0 and so on. So, you, you just try doing this to each of these um, to, to each of you know these uh, nine multiplications you will have to do and you will notice that really you are you are not adding anything new it is just the, the same answer as before okay, with the zero tagged along. Okay, so that means that if B A is identity then the augmented matrices B hat and A hat also give product identity but observe that both B hat and A hat have determinant zero. Right. Now, I am in, in the, the square matrix case and I can compute determinants. Now, observe determinant of B hat A hat must actually be the determinant of the identity matrix which is 1, but we know that this is determinant of B hat, determinant of A hat. Well, both of which are 0 because we explicitly put one 0 row or 0 column into both. Okay, um, so that's that's the end of the proof. That's a contradiction, right? You cannot have B A equals identity means that uh, you can't have M less than N. Observe, by the way, in this case that A B could be identity. If you try doing the same proof with A B, you won't be able to construct a contradiction. Okay, it's only B A that uh, breaks down. Okay, so that's the end of the proof because. Uh, we have shown that m less than n gives rise to a contradiction. If n is less than m, then you, you do the other order. Then you show that uh, a, b cannot give you the identity. Okay? So, this is an important statement. So, what this finally this proposition proves is that r m and r n can be isomorphic if and only if n and m are the same. Okay? And this involves uh, the assumption that r is a commutator.